Welcome to the White Spring Bunker. These halls were built to safeguard some of the most prestigious members of the United States government. Now we are all that remains. Though we are always looking for men and women capable of helping us restore what has been lost. In return, we offer this, our refuge from the world above. Please, take your time and look around. We've made great efforts to restore this place to its former glory. Welcome, member, to our little enclave. Welcome back, members. As always, I am the operative, your designated tour guide and host here at the White Spring. Even as the residents of Vault 76 spread throughout Appalachia and encountered the many dangers of the wasteland, they couldn't help but wonder what was happening on the other side of the mountains. Colonel Valeria was focused on the challenges in front of her, the Scorched, the Super Mutants, and the tasks of rebuilding in the name of the new Enclave. However, no plan is perfect, and the winds of change are beginning to blow. This episode contains content which some may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Lieutenant Colonel Valeria put the finishing touches on her weekly operations report before submitting the file to MODIS. She closed down the terminal, leaned back in her chair, and thought back over the past year. She had many successes to celebrate, and a few failures which she still carried on her shoulders. The new enclave had risen, and they had carved out a significant piece of Appalachia under their direct authority. The alignment with the Morgantown settlement had led to similar arrangements with other settlements in the forest, ash sheep, and toxic valley regions. The Savage Divide, Mire, and Cranberry Bog were still primarily operational zones, not fit for human habitation, despite their best efforts. They had gained valuable data from the old DIA facility at Sugar Grove, including an almost complete technical archive, which Modus was still processing. It was Operation Beowulf, which still weighed heavily on her mind. The origins of the plan rested with a group that called themselves the Brotherhood of Steel. Those former soldiers had fought a nearly decade-long war against the Scorched, one that they ultimately lost. Valeria knew it was only a matter of time before the new enclave would have to confront the Scorch themselves, and the newly revised plan she had named Beowulf was their best chance of success. However, she still hesitated. She needed more time to train the members and finish the new power armor suits. Such are the burdens of leadership. It was up to her to make the hard choices, as Captain Stein constantly reminded her. The colonel could hear carts being pushed down the hallway outside her office. Establishing relations with Morgantown had increased the number of recruits who had shown up at their door. Modus had opened up additional areas of the bunker, and most of the functions of the new enclave were now being handled by humans, not bots. Captain Stein was still front and center training the new recruits. The nicknames of Fossil and Old Man Stein were now said more in reverence than scorn as they once had been, and Valeria was glad to have him on their side. She had also made a change to Team Alpha. Cindy, now Corporal Cindy, had completed her training passed with flying colors, actually. However, Valeria was concerned how the girl would perform in the field. She may have been a fighter, but did she have what it takes to get the job done? The colonel wasn't so sure, but the only way she could find out was to evaluate her on a field assignment. Valeria stretched and yawned. It was getting late, and she really should get back to her quarters. Suddenly, her terminal reactivated. As the CRT glow settled, she was greeted with the familiar face of Modus. Good evening, Colonel. We are so glad to have caught you in your office. Modus, always a pleasure. We received a priority download from the Kovac Muldoon and only just completed our analysis of the data. The results require your immediate attention. What did you find, Modus? Colonel, our analysis is incomplete, but we believe that the region has received new visitors, quite a few in fact. Visitors, Modus? People, Colonel. People from outside Appalachia. This was not anticipated at this time. Are you sure? Until our analysis is complete, we cannot say with 100% certainty. However, locations which we regularly monitor, along with intercepted radio transmissions, indicate changes we cannot ascribe to Vault 76 residents. Modus, not that I don't believe you, but 
We haven't seen another living soul from outside Appalachia since Reclamation Day, Sergeant Muller being the single exception. It is Sergeant Muller's existence which lends the most credence to our analysis, Colonel. We will continue to analyze the data, but direct confirmation is required. We would like your team to attempt to contact these new visitors and return back with additional data. Indeed, you've read my mind, Modus. For something this vital to our cause, I would trust no other to such a task. Please forward any new information to the Operations Center as soon as you receive it. The colonel switched off the terminal, took her cap from her desk, and walked out into the hallway. The Assaultron posted there delivered its standard line. Ma'am? Although it was late, Valeria needed to find her team. She started by walking down to the production wing. Sergeant Muller was a stickler for caring for his power armor, and could usually be found making minor adjustments and repairs. Looking across the busy production floor, she spotted the sergeant in his normal spot, bent over a half-disassembled torso, busy with a welding torch. Sergeant Muller! Her voice cut through the cacophony, stopping most of the maintenance crew in their tracks. The sergeant merely waved her over, never taking his eyes off his work. Muller, I hope you can put your bucket of bolts back together by tomorrow morning. The sergeant cut the torch and lifted his safety visor. You have got to be kidding me, Colonel. You're supposed to have a week to rest up, and this armor needs a lot more work. Sorry, Muller, but something big is brewing and Modus needs us back in the field. If you can stomach it, I'll ask the crew here to lend a hand. Valeria motioned the crew chief over, while the sergeant just rolled his eyes. Seriously, Colonel, is this really necessary? Absolutely necessary and deadly serious. I need your armor ready and you in the briefing room at 0630 tomorrow morning. Yes, ma'am. As the colonel walked away, she could already hear Muller arguing with the crew chief, but certain that they'd get the job done. From the production wing, she climbed down the stairs to the foyer, and then took a left into one of the newly reopened areas of the bunker, the weapons lab and firing range. The R&D staff had already left for the evening, but as usual, the firing range was open much later, and was currently in use by several operatives. They were test firing the latest improved plasma rifles, just off the production lines. After quite a bit of tinkering, R&D had managed to improve the power and damage, but modifying the weapons was taking up valuable time and resources. At the last range position, the object of the colonel's search was switching between a modified combat rifle and a submachine gun. Shouldering the combat rifle, Corporal Cindy fired three quick bursts, which cut the assigned target nearly in half. The colonel stood just behind her and to the left, and watched as she cleanly changed magazines and blew apart the second target. Ejecting the last magazine, Cindy put down the weapon and removed the eye and ear protection before turning around, and being startled to find the colonel standing there. She quickly snapped to attention. (laughs) Sorry, ma'am. I didn't see you there. As you were, and I was just enjoying the impressive display. Thank you, ma'am. You know what they say, practice makes perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, they do say a lot of things, don't they? Um, I keep meaning to ask, though. Who are they, and why do they say all those things? It's just an expression, Corporal. But I'm here because we're heading out on an assignment tomorrow. Briefing is at 0630, and I expect you to be early. Also, I need you to find Major Lilith and let her know as well. You might check the commissary first. Tell her I expect her to be early as well, though I'll be just as happy if she's not late. Again. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything I should know, Colonel? Not until the briefing, Corporal. But start packing for some serious travel. And no mention of this to anyone else, is that clear? Of course, ma'am. Thank you. The colonel saluted and left the firing range. She needed to find Stein, and between them, review the information Modus should have downloaded to her terminal. It felt like it was going to be a long night. Cindy watched the colonel leave, then methodically disassembled her weapon for cleaning. She'd fallen in love with life in the Enclave, and had thrown herself at every challenge presented with a youthful enthusiasm. After putting everything away, she donned her cap and left to go find the Major. Cindy remembered her first meeting with Major Lilith. It was soon after she arrived in the bunker, while she had been recovering in the med bay. Cindy had already heard the rumors regarding the Major, and even Muller took her aside to let her know that Lilith was a little... weird. She had been a bit groggy with all the drugs, so when what appeared to be a nurse came in to check on her, she thought nothing of it, until she saw the mask she was wearing. It was one of those plague doctor masks, and in the creepiest voice she ever heard, it said, The nightmare nurse will see you now. 
Cindy nearly jumped out of bed and probably would have done so if she hadn't been hooked up to a host of machines. Luckily, the colonel had been right behind her and slapped her upside her head. Lilith, what did I tell you about wearing that mask in the bunker? I'm sorry, Val. Dr. Harefield had scolded all of them for bothering her patient, but afterwards they had a good laugh about it, although the colonel still confiscated the mask. Colonel Valeria had briefed Cindy on Lilith later, and she was under strict orders to, as the colonel put it, ignore certain behaviors. And in the field, Cindy saw just how good of an operative Lilith was, tearing through super mutants like they were tissue paper. It was her other habits, though, that she still found quite disturbing. Cindy was never quite sure how the colonel could have a conversation with Lilith while the major was stuffing her face with entrails. Cindy made her way down to the commissary. Dinner had ended a couple of hours before, and she suspected that the major would have waited for most people to leave before eating herself. She may not have cared much about what the others thought, but the colonel had delivered a very blunt message about appearances. If one person could get Lilith to play by the rules, it was Colonel Valeria. The corporal made it to the commissary entrance, only to be nearly bowled over by Corporal Jones and Corporal Thomas, running out at full speed. Hey, watch it, you two! Oh, sorry. sorry. The two members took off running down the hallway, not looking back. Well, that's both a good and a bad sign. Sure enough, when Cindy entered the dining hall, Lilith was in the corner, eating alone. The major looked up, mouth still full, and motioned Cindy over. Her plate was full of indescribable goo and gore, all of which she was happily munching on. Cindy started memorizing the ceiling tiles as the major finished her meal. After swallowing the final bite, Lilith finally spoke. (laughs) You'd think I'd threatened those poor boys. All I did was offer them some food. Um, yeah. (laughs) Well, the colonel wanted me to find you. What's wrong this time? I promise I did not threaten to rip Private Olson's ears off and shove them up his ass. I swear. No, ma'am. Nothing like that. Oh. Then forget I said anything. The colonel wanted to tell you that we have a briefing at 0630 tomorrow morning. Something important has come up and we've got an assignment. You've got to be kidding me. I need my beauty sleep. And 0630 is way too early. I'm sorry, Major, but the Colonel was quite specific. She also said she didn't want you to be late. Damn it all. First she takes away my mask, asks me to play nice, and now I have to be up at some ungodly hour. This is just too much. Lilith ranted for another few minutes before sulking in her seat, looking petulant. Finally, she took her plate and heaved it across the commissary, watching it smash and spray the remains of her food all over the wall. The bunker protectrons were already moving to clean up the mess, as was the standard when Lilla threw one of her little temper tantrums. At least this time she hadn't put an assaultron into the repair queue. Sorry about that, kid. Got a little fussy, and still a little hungry. Let the colonel know I'll see her in the morning. By the way, you haven't seen Operative Olsen around, have you? (laughs) Sandy didn't bother to say anything, but just shook her head. She could never tell when the Major was serious, and this time, she didn't even want to try. Having delivered her message, Cindy left to get back to her quarters. Per the Colonel's directive, she had some packing to do. Hi, I'm Fire Rider, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games, from major characters who define the course of a game's storyline to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices and discover the real-world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. O six fifteen in the Enclave Operations Center. 
The colonel leaned back in her chair and yawned. Another cup of coffee, please. Protect and serve. The colonel had been up since 0300, doing a final review of Modus's data. No matter which way she looked at it, she couldn't poke holes in his conclusions. Sure enough, there appeared to be a big influx of people coming into the region. This news threatened to undermine the work they had done so far, and dislocate their plans for the future. It was imperative that they get more information, and maybe even a subject or two for interrogation, to determine what kind of threat this was, and perhaps if it could be turned into an opportunity. Modus's sensors and the Kovac Muldoon were only going to provide so much, which meant that they were going to get dirty, potentially very dirty, to get what they needed. She also needed to make sure that this information stayed with her team alone. Until they knew more, she was unsure of what this might do to the morale of the rest of the new enclave. It was different when they were fighting against an existential threat, but new people? That changed the dynamics immeasurably. Valeria was just about to check the time when there was a knock at the door. The door slid open and Corporal Cindy walked through, saluted, and took a chair at the end of the table. You found Major Lilith? Yes, ma'am. Good. I'm looking forward to informing her that Modus has already deducted the cost of the flatware and the plates from her pay this week. A few minutes later, Sergeant Muller walked in, looking a bit haggard. But all business. Armor good to go, Sergeant? Well, I didn't have to put anyone in the med bay, so yeah, it's fixed. About as well as it could be under the circumstances. Valeria nodded. She'd heard as much from the crew chief. Once they'd gotten into a rhythm, even they were surprised how well they managed to work together. Something that did bode well for the future. She looked at the wall clock again. It was almost 0630, and no sign of Lilith. She had a conversation with Private Olsen last night, and made yet another reminder to talk to Lilith about her manners. Much to her surprise, Lilith walked into the room at exactly 0630, but she was wearing what looked like a costume straight out of an old Robin Hood movie, and a combat field helmet, a couple of sizes too big. At this point, however, the colonel was happy that she was wearing clothes. It wasn't a battle she was prepared to fight, as they had much more important things to discuss. Take a seat, Lilith. We have received vital information which could impact the future of not only the Enclave, but all of Appalachia as well. After Lilla sat, the colonel turned to the main view screen. Modus, please present your analysis. Thank you, colonel. As you are aware, we utilize a variety of remote sensors, transmission detectors, and the equipment on the Kovac Muldoon to monitor activities across Appalachia. Until very recently, we had successfully identified all known threats, along with mapping the various Vault 76 resident settlements. This changed 22 hours and 6 minutes ago. An anomaly triggered an emergency download from the Kovac, which detailed something we had not seen before. Transmissions of unknown origin and movement in areas which had been unpopulated. The colonel sat passively, watching the expressions of her team. It was Muller who spoke first. What exactly do you mean, Modus? By our calculations, we are 98.3% confident that this data represents a migration of new individuals into the region. People, Modus? Sergeant Muller. You are aware that the war did not exterminate humans outside of Appalachia. However, we do not know the number, location, or, most importantly, their intentions. Goody. Fresh meat. Modus, please continue. Yes, Colonel. We have calculated several likely locations for investigation. All of them are currently in the northern part of the Toxic Valley and the Mire. We have suppressed news of this discovery from the other members. Which means nothing related to our current assignment leaves this room. As far as everyone else is concerned, Team Alpha is on priority assignment to classified Indigo Zeta. Modus and Captain Stein will remain in command until we return. Cindy raised her hand, a habit left over from her days back in Vault 76. Corporal, you don't have to raise your hand. Sorry, Colonel. Are we going to help these new people? 
Enough, Lilith. Corporal, time will tell. First, we need to confirm the location, size, and intent of these newcomers. If practical, it could expand the possibilities of our rebuilding efforts significantly. If their intentions, however, conflict with our own, we may need to take drastic actions. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. And Lilith, until we know otherwise, we play nice. But if necessary, it will be time to not be nice. Modus, please bring up the regional map. The view screen changed to show the current map of Appalachia. The White Spring and the Allied settlements were shown in blue. The known locations of Scorchby's activity were highlighted in red, super mutants in green, and miscellaneous threats in yellow. Next, the map moved to show a close-up of the northern regions, with outlined bubbles around several areas in the Toxic Valley and the Mire. As you can see, MODIS information places our targets in the north. We are going on very limited information here, so gathering what intel we can is vital. I've called in most of the other teams because the last thing we need is unintended contact. From White Springs, we'll travel north to resupply at Morgantown. They've also recently had traders come through from other settlements, so we'll use that opportunity to see what rumors are floating around. After that, we travel through Grafton and points north before heading east across the Savage Divide into the Mire. This is, for the most part, uncharted territory, as our operations have been focused on dealing with the Scorched and containing the Super Mutants. We have regular check-ins with Modus, but otherwise we're on our own. Just the way I like it. And Lilith, we'll be covering some territory you should be more familiar with, so I'll need you to take point once we get past Grafton. Right now, I'll expect you to run a couple of hours ahead and clear the way, if necessary, but if you run into any people, not Scorched, not Super Mutants, not anything that we haven't already put on the kill on sight list, do not engage. That's a direct order. Gotcha, Val. Muller, I want you running Heavy Gunner this time around. We run into anything big and scary, you make sure it ends up dead. And Cindy, this is your first deep recon assignment. You've come a long way, and think of this as the final test of your abilities. You stick close to me and provide support where needed. Yes, ma'am. Modus, is there anything else you've gleaned from the data we should be aware of? No, Colonel. If we uncover anything new, we will be in contact. Thank you, Modus. For the rest of you, you have four hours to pack and prep. We'll depart at 1100 on the nose. God bless the Enclave. God bless America. Hello, this is Charlie Transmutation coming to you with another PSA announcement. No, Charlie, this is a commercial. What? Crap. Nobody told me that. What are you supposed to do in this thing anyway? Well, Charlie, I'm glad you asked. This is the part where we introduce our new homebrew 5e D&D podcast, The Fumbling Four and the Almighty Cray, where we explore the homebrew world of Alteris using homebrew rules and homebrew material from the Dungeon Master's Guild. Eh, sounds boring. I'm out of here. See you later, Charlie. We hope to have you guys come check us out soon. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. The team had made good progress on the road north. Small caravans were now a regular sight, traveling between the more established settlements. Through the colonel's efforts, most of them were at least on good terms with the new enclave, and some of the larger ones were officially their allies. Morgantown Airport had been the first, and was still, by far, the most important to the new enclave's plans. It served as a trading post, a source of food and supplies, and a rest stop for their teams operating in the northern half of Appalachia. The colonel made sure that Lilith was on her best behavior, but she quickly got bored and decided to take a trip down memory lane at the Morgantown High School. Cindy almost tagged along before the colonel dissuaded her. That was a particular story she didn't want to have told. And the three of them spent the day with Captain Edwards and the rest of the Morgantown Council. At first, it had been an awkward reunion with Cindy having run away to join the new enclave. But Edwards admitted that the life seemed to suit her, and he was glad that she was in good hands. The news from the settlement was generally very positive. The volume of trade was increasing, and their situation continued to improve. Of course, the assistance of two platoons of New Enclave bots had also helped quite a bit. Colonel, we can't thank you enough for all your help. It has been our pleasure, Captain. I've already forwarded your latest requisition request back to Modus. 
Some of the items might be hard to find, but we'll do what we can. And here's a list of items we've identified we would need in return. Hmm. Let me take a look. Well, lucky for you, Colonel. A lot of this is actually sitting on site. Any specific caravan you'd prefer I use? No preference at all, Captain. We respect your judgment. Valeria leaned back in her chair, a sure sign to Edwards that she was about to change the subject. Now the formalities are out of the way. I bet you're about to tell me why you're really here. <laughs> I guess I need to work on my poker face. While it's good to catch up, we're also here looking for information. With all of the traffic coming through here now, I'm sure you hear things. What kind of things? Change, Captain. It's been almost a year since Reclamation Day, and it feels like something is coming. So we wanted to see what you've heard and who you may have heard it from. You know I don't put much stock in stories and rumors, Colonel. Indulge me, Captain. Well, we had a group stop in last week. A few regulars who scavenged out by Anchor Farm and Points West. They were saying it looked like some folks were messing around at the farm. Now, that's not unusual. A lot of people still wandering around, but... They said they found some uniforms, ones they'd never seen before. Had some kind of logo or insignia on them. Of course, they didn't grab one or bring one back with them, so who knows what they saw, or if they saw anything at all. Any chance these scavers are still around? No such luck, I'm afraid. They finished their trades and headed back west. Don't expect they'll be back for weeks. Anything else? A couple of days ago, we had a runner come in. He was in a bad way, pretty cut up. He'd been taking messages between here and a small group in Mononga, up near the old mine. Never had any trouble. Not since one of your teams cleaned out those mole miners, but we never could get a radio to work there either. Hence the runner. And they paid well, too. Lots of good scrap. So, the doc tried to patch him up as best he could, but he'd been hanging by a thread. He must have been delirious, because he kept mumbling something about eagles, over and over. He passed yesterday, too cut up and infected for us to do anything about. I was just about to send someone else to check on those folks, but maybe you'd like to take a look first? Valeria was painting a picture in her head, considering the two stories. Unfortunately, they pointed in two completely different directions. She could either head west to check on Anchor Farm, or east to Mananga. Splitting the team wasn't an option, so it was going to have to be one or the other. I believe we'll take you up on your offer. What can you tell me about the community in Mononga? Small group. A few families, mostly. One of the men had been a mining inspector before the war and thought he could make a go of it. Religious folks, too. You might remember a few of them from the vault. They were the ones who always had services down in the chapel on Saturdays. Ah, Valeria remembered those people. Neither she nor her parents had any time for religion in any form, but she'd peeked in on one of their services. She swore some of them were speaking some weird language. When she told her parents about it, they just laughed and said something about tongues. Valeria never got the joke. I remember them. They were pretty cagey at first, but once we got some trade going, they warmed up. When they agreed to pay for the runner, things got even better. I sure hope nothing's happened to them. Can't spare anyone to go with you, but could you let us know? Certainly, Captain. And I appreciate the information. Always a pleasure, Captain. No problem at all, Colonel. You've done a great job with Cindy. I was afraid she was going to bite off more than she could chew one of these days, but I'm impressed. You can tell Sergeant Muller that he's welcome to stop by at any time. I think Melissa's taken quite the shine to him. Oh, I will definitely let him know. We'll need to grab some supplies and be on our way. As soon as you have any new information, we will let you know. After shaking hands, Valeria left the terminal building to round up the rest of her team. She found Cindy showing off her uniform to some of the other teenagers and regaling them with tales of her exploits with the new enclave. Sergeant Muller was stomping around, chasing the school kids in a game of tag, which of course they'd always win, while Melissa watched from a respectful distance. When she whistled him over, he was immediately swarmed by children, all demanding that he stay. It took quite a bit of effort, with Melissa having to scold several of the children before the sergeant could free himself. The colonel swore she saw Muller wink at the school teacher, though later he heartily denied it. The three gathered up the last of the supplies they'd need before saying their last goodbyes to the settlers and headed off in the direction of Morgantown High School. Colonel, what'd you find out? We're heading to Monongah. 
It's a little detour for us, but Edwards mentioned a few things which got my attention. Said he lost contact with a group up there, and as far as I remember from our last briefing, there weren't any other Vault 76 factions in that area, and haven't been for quite some time. Once we pick up Lilith, we're going to head there and see what we can find. Roger, ma'am. The team left the airport and worked their way over to the high school. Once there, they could see Lilith's handiwork and the bodies of several gutted scorched. Stay here. Valeria entered the school and followed the trail of scorched bodies Lilith left in her wake. Heading down towards the gymnasium, she walked through the double doors and found Lilith leisurely feasting on a scorched corpse. The colonel had learned to give Lilith her space when she needed it. Blowing off a bit of steam made her easier to work with. Oh, hey, Val. Did you know this is where I played with Bobby? Right there, in fact. You know how badly I wanted to see him again. After leaving the vault, sure, it was some fun and games, but nothing quite compared to little Bobby. I nearly wet myself when I saw you punch him, and I just couldn't stand the thought of you having all the fun. Valeria had been hard to shock before, but spending enough time in the wasteland had made her immune to even the most horrible atrocities, especially when working directly with Lilith. Deep down, Valeria envied Lilith's freedom. Her own mask had only slipped once or twice, because she knew she needed to keep a tight rein on her emotions. One complete psychopath in the new enclave was enough, thank you very much. He cried right up until the end. You asked old Ed about Bobby? About finding him? Of course not, Lil. That's a shame. I would have loved to see his face. Time to go. We have a new target. Clean up and be out front in five. And please, no leftovers. Yes, ma'am. Long gone are the days where people sing about West Virginia as almost heaven. After nuclear war and disease, it's far from heaven now. Far From Heaven, a Fallout 76 story podcast, is a tale of survival, conflict and hope set in the Fallout 76 game world. Join our survivors on their journey to reach that almost heaven once more. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon and many other great podcasts and apps. Far From Heaven. Fallout 76 story, available now. Two days later, the team had traveled light and fast, wanting to make the climb to Monongah in daylight. Despite all the progress made over the past year, the Savage Divide was still an area to be feared. The Colonel held those who braved its challenges in high regard, and those who attempted to live there, well, they were either incredibly brave or incredibly stupid. Perhaps both. Lilith had been in high spirits. She'd been scouting ahead and happened upon a nest of scorched at Bolton Greens. The team heard the firing, but by the time they'd come up, she'd killed each and every one of them. Cindy had even joked that maybe next time, Lilith could save some for the rest of them. Of course, Lilith got the last laugh by saying that she did, then offering up a roasted scorched head. Even the colonel found that a little funny, even if Cindy didn't. All joking aside, Sergeant Muller took point as they started up the road leading to the Monongah Power Station. The Enclave had attempted to get some of the stations restarted early on, but the technical requirements stretched their meager resources almost to the breaking point. After a particularly costly failure at Poseidon Energy, which almost resulted in a total meltdown, the colonel prohibited further attempts until they were better prepared. The Monongah plant would have been the second one restarted, but they never got beyond the initial scouting activity. As they walked past the large cooling towers, the first signs of recent human activity could be seen. New barricades had been crafted, and it looked as though some of the old damage had been repaired. Colonel, take a look at that. Muller pointed to several tattered flags hanging from makeshift metal poles. Valeria walked over and pulled down one of them. It was some kind of icon, painted in red on an old burlap sack. Lilith walked over and sniffed it. It's blood. Maybe a week old? Raiders? <laughs> Not 76 wannabes. No, Corporal. We've been tracking those groups, and the last intel put them nowhere near here. This is something or someone else. Valeria dropped the flag and took out her binoculars, scanning up towards the town itself. Lilith. Cindy. 
I want you two to scout ahead. Approach the town from the south. Muller and I will investigate here. It looks like no one is home, but I want to make sure. As soon as we're finished, we'll join you. If you find anything out of the ordinary, report back to us. And don't engage hostiles unless you absolutely have to. There may be friendlies about, and I don't want anyone caught in the crossfire. Understood? Yes, ma'am. As the two disappeared from view, Valeria and Muller started searching the power station. All around them, they found evidence of recent use, including some decorations made of human remains. Super mutants? Don't think so. No mutie bodies, no blood bags, and no tracks. Once inside, they found most of the power terminals either trashed or looted. No way they'd be powering up this station anytime soon. Someone, or many someones, had gone through and done a real number on the place. This doesn't make any sense. Vault 76 raiders never trashed places like this before. I don't think it was them. These flags and symbols don't match anything we've seen. I'm sending this image to Modus. In several locations around the plant, they also found signs with serious fighting. Spent shell casings, scorch marks from lasers and plasma blasts could be found all over the facility. They also identified numerous blood splatters and smears. Well, whoever was here, they didn't go down without a fight. The colonel could only nod. They had a lot of evidence, but it wasn't leading to any concrete conclusions. The pieces weren't fitting together as nicely as she'd like. Val, you better come see what we found. Valeria whistled over to Muller and signaled it was time to go. They left the power plant with more questions than answered, which only made the investigation that much more urgent. They found Lilith and Cindy near Monaga Church. The colonel had been through the town a few times before, months ago, but in the time since, the small group of settlers who had lived there had done a lot of work. The church had been fixed up, with the beginnings of a fresh coat of paint on three of the four sides, and many of the buildings in town showed signs of repairs, and even previous habitation. New barricades had been erected, and there was even new turrets placed at strategic locations around the area. The colonel walked up to the two operatives. Cindy looked pale and a little sick, while Lilith had her arm around her. What did you find? Cindy bent over and vomited on the ground. Follow me. Hey, Mueller. Can you get Cindy some water? Muller took some water from his pack and helped Cindy sit down in the dirt. Valeria followed Lilith over to the church. The front doors had been broken in, one hanging off of a single hinge while the other laid on the ground next to the entrance. The side of the church had been painted in one of those strange symbols, again done in blood. There was a sickly, coppery smell emanating from the interior, and she could hear the buzzing of what sounded like thousands of flies. Lilith put on a gas mask and motioned for the colonel to do the same. While she hated wearing the scout mask, even Lilith was donning protective gear, which meant that she should definitely do the same. Together, they walked into the church and into what the colonel thought was some kind of slaughterhouse and not a house of worship. There were bodies, or at least parts of bodies, everywhere, covered in a layer of flies and maggots. In places, it seemed like the entire floor was nothing more than a wriggling mask of insect larvae. Blood was splattered over the pews, the walls, even the ceiling. And even with the mask, Valeria could feel the bile rising in her throat. Choking it down, she made her way carefully through the interior, stepping over and around the bodies. Each and every one of them had been savagely torn apart and piled together. The worst, and probably what had broken Cindy, were the children. There were at least four or five of them, no more than eight or nine years old, and from what she could tell, what had been done to them was indescribable. Beyond the carnage, what caught the colonel's attention was something written above the altar. Two words had been scrawled there, above another one of those strange symbols. Hell here. Valeria took another picture to send to Modus. Did you find anything else? Someone hit this place hard and fast. Just about everything of value was looted. Looked like they brought everyone who was still alive in here and had themselves quite a party. We found more bodies in some of the houses in the same state. A few made a run toward the old mine. Almost got there, too. I found blood trails heading north into the Divide. Didn't get a chance to follow them. Wanted you to see this first. No way Vault Dix did this. Valeria took another step and felt something squish under her boot. The bile rose again and she had to get out of there before she got sick herself. Once she hit the fresh air, she removed the mask 
dropping it on the ground, put her hands on her knees, taking deep breaths. Taking a few minutes to compose herself, she looked over at Muller and then gestured to the church. Burn it. Muller hesitated. It was a church after all. I said burn it. Muller pulled out his plasma flamer and walked over to the building. As the sergeant put the structure to the flame, Valeria took Lilith by the arm. Find those tracks. Valeria walked over to Cindy, still green and holding her head in her hands. Corporal, on your feet. I want you to document everything and get it sent over to Modus. Cindy didn't get up. She didn't respond. She just sat there with a blank stare. Valeria could feel her anger rising, and she grabbed the corporal by her pack. I said, on your feet! She turned the corporal around. Cindy's face was dirty, red, and streaked with tears. My God. I never... I mean, who does that? Those poor children! Get a hold of yourself, soldier. Valeria got right in Cindy's face. Not sorry that she had slapped her. Hard to get her attention. Don't ever make me give you an order twice. I need you to document the evidence here and get it to Modus now. Cindy slowly wiped her face on her sleeve and then put her glasses back on. Sorry, ma'am. It won't happen again. I know it won't. As the church burned behind them, Cindy started recording on a holotape and taking pictures of what they found. The colonel pulled out a regional map from her pack and put it on the ground in front of her. Tracing their route and examining the terrain, she started to guess where these attackers might have come from and where they might be going. Running her finger along the edge of the Savage Divide, it provided not only a barrier to people entering the region, but also a significant one to people leaving. Whoever attacked the settlement had to come from the north, and they would probably be heading back that way as well. Val. Go ahead, Lilith. Those tracks head north, probably as you suspected. Looks like about a dozen or so, with a few Brahmin too. Maybe a two, three day head start on us. Over. Looking back at the map, Valeria saw the most likely destination. Sunny Top Ski Resort. It had been an old raider base before the Scorch put an end to the raiders as they had been back then. One of her teams had cleared out several weeks before, said the place was a dump and not really worthy of any habitation, human or otherwise. But it was a convenient stopover point. So north it was. Will, give me your coordinates and we'll meet you in 30 minutes. Thank you again, members, for joining us here on The Modus Files. Stay tuned for the thrilling conclusion of Encounter at Sunny Top in part two of the episode, coming soon. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe, and better yet, please leave a review to help others find our little enclave. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Modus Files, for more information about our podcast, Fallout 76 content, and random musings on the enclave. I'd also like to thank our cast, Fendora Beatrix as Lieutenant Colonel Valeria, Scald as Major Lilith, Rhea Cheshire as Corporal Cindy, Austin Rogers as Corporal Jones, Aaron Foster as Corporal Thomas, and Brad Williams as the voice of Modus, Sergeant Muller, and Captain Edwards. Finally, introducing Mandy Marie B. as Executive Producer and Art Director. We'd also like to thank the Mr. Jones Show for providing our podcast cover art. You can find him on Twitter, at Blanken Media. And a shout-out to the Apocalyptic Aristocracy Discord, home to a great group of fellow creators, the Robots Radio Podcast Community and the rest of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, and Jeremiah Johnson, our favorite character artist, who provided the wonderful character artwork you can find on our website. Lastly, thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. God bless the Enclave, and God bless America. Members, we look forward to your next visit to our little Enclave.